In part one I painted a broad brush picture of the character of the southern salt rivers of Western Australia. But in this second part we'll take a look at the activity taking place here in the saline streams on a typical working day. Over a number of years various projects had provided us with an opportunity to explore the rivers in greater detail and the pools were a focal point for the aquatic studies. Beneath the land surface there's an old and complex geological structure and a dark underground water world. Before the land was cleared the native vegetation intercepted much of the rainfall and this regulated the groundwater level. But in the open landscape a greater portion descends to the water table and it's been filling up, a bit like a bathtub. And it's a leaky bathtub. Salt, accumulating deep down in the subsoil, is being brought to the surface and leaking into the valleys. This is not only a threat to farming, but it kills all but the hardiest of native plants. It's not a pretty sight. The removal of the dense bushland has also altered the way in which storm water runs off the slopes, seeking out a nearby creek line. The rushing water easily takes away the fragile topsoil, digging new channels and enlarging the old. Landholders use a variety of surface drains to control water movement and ponding in the landscape. Vegetation also acts to control water movement and stabilise stream channels. The native sedges are particularly effective when they drape over the banks and help protect them from being eroded during floods. Here you can see how the fringing plants have managed to hold the bed and banks in place. Thick groves of paper barks in the channel bed help reduce the power of the flood. They're resilient, but not indestructible. For these reasons, the vegetation type and its condition also provide clues about the stability of the river ecosystem. The pools are the heart of the aquatic environment, so let's take a look at what's living beneath the surface. 
In these parts we won't find any large predators like saltwater crocodiles or piranha, so there's not much to worry about. Well, a few things maybe. Water clarity is variable and the depths have an element of mystery about them. So how do we find out what's living in there? The techniques are simple, nets and jars and trays, but in the interest of science it has to be done in a systematic way to reduce the risks of missing something important. Most of what happens here is in slow motion and extra high definition, at least as far as we're concerned. And to get a good handle on what's happening, you have to come back again and again over many years. The most obvious animal life are the bugs called macroinvertebrates and many of the locals are able to survive the wide variations in salinity, but not all of them. A few species are able to survive extreme saline conditions. Some species do this by producing eggs, seeds or cysts that can survive periods of drought. Others simply fly out of the pool and look for a refuge elsewhere. One of the difficulties is sampling in gungy water full of algae. Excess algal growth is common and occurs with a good dose of sunlight and an excess of nutrients in the streams. Like the estuaries, the condition of the riverbed is an important element affecting water quality. Sediments store nutrients and under certain conditions these can be released. An important aquatic plant is the grass-like rupia. It can form dense underwater jungles and supports many crustaceans as well as insects. Rupia germination and growth is triggered by fresher flows after rainfall events, but it also handles the high salt levels. Ducks enjoy grazing here as well. The eggs of this damselfly will either be eaten by something else or hatch into aquatic larvae that feed on microscopic algae and crustaceans. The region still contains species of macroinvertebrates that are yet to be described and named. The aquatic caterpillar seen in the middle here hatch out of the water as moths. They eat the microalgae on the rupia. This is a speck swimmer, so named because they swim upside down. This particular species also inhabits fresh to brackish water only. Swimming up in the middle there is a little Daphne or water flea that are microcrustaceans. They live in a range of salt and fresh water. 
Okay, we have here a caddisfly larvae that likes to live in the slightly brackish waters. He has a case around him made of little sticks to protect his soft body from predators. He's eating micro algae attached to the stems of the rupia. In amongst the sand here are little seed shrimps or ostracods. There are many different species of these that live in the saline waters on the south coast, some of them still undescribed. Scooting across the bottom is a colourful water beetle. As in any garden, the Ripia forest have snails eating the algae and the leaves. At the other extreme, this pool on the Suzetta River is hypersaline and these pink brine shrimp are doing well enough but they're not native to Western Australia. The eggs float and attach to the feathers of ducks and wading birds who have dispersed them into various localities. This brown material is not mud, it's the brine shrimp eggs. This is a jolly tail minnow. They can survive in moderate salinities. On the left is the goby. They're common in estuaries and go up the saline rivers and can tolerate quite high levels of salinity. Small shrimp on the right also tolerates moderate levels of salinity. Permanent changes to what lives in a river are often only discernible over long periods of time and that's very true for the salt rivers where conditions can swing back and forth naturally from day to day, season to season and year to year. Gaining a good understanding of the aquatic ecosystem will require a commitment to ongoing investigations beyond the time frame of many projects. The complex natural variability cannot be fully appreciated through casual observations. These tiny creatures lack the kudos we give to the much loved large furry marsupials. Yet their activity is essential and provides a resource at the lower end of the food chain. The aquatic animals of the salt rivers do not exist in idyllic isolation. Each pool is embedded in a catchment and it's important to gather a wide range of information in order to understand why they live where they do. That includes the surrounding vegetation and the water quality. Even the shape of the channel is important as well as the erosion and sedimentation happening upstream. Protecting our rivers is not as simple as finding a magic ingredient to halt the changes or return things to the way they were. The challenge will be to keep the rate at which certain processes, like salinisation and erosion, at a level that the river can cope with, especially the pools. It's about compensating for the side effects we have unwittingly imposed on them. The overriding rule of thumb 
is that every stream, from the least to the greatest, requires some level of protection and special management. Often that means fencing off the creeks to let the farmer do the managing, rather than letting sheep and cattle decide the agenda for the day. Healthy fringing vegetation is necessary protection and the preference is for the native species that are adapted to the area. That's quite a challenge because exotic weeds and animals now compete with the local plants and fencing will mean a commitment to ongoing maintenance. Many South Coast landowners are passionate about managing their environment and have been active in undertaking various river protection initiatives over the past two decades, but the task is far from completed. Making a living from the land has never been an easy task, and after all, there are only 24 hours in the day. Will we achieve a balance between land use and conserving the remaining natural values of these catchments? As usual, time will reveal the final judgement.